Let's pray together as we open God's word. Lord, we thank you just for who you are, great and awesome God, Lord. And just thank you for uh, this opportunity we have to just look through the Gospels at some various encounters with Jesus, Father. And we just see that as Jesus encountered people, he literally changed our lives. And so, Lord, I just pray that that would be true of each one here as well, that, that our lives would be radically changed by Jesus Christ, Lord, and that, that we might just be different ourselves and make a difference in the world around us as well. Lord, right now, this world needs Christians, needs people who will make that difference. So, Lord, I just pray that, that we might be those people. And just ask that you speak to us now as you open your word. Just challenge us and encourage us, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So as you know, there is certainly a lot of unrest in America today. Protests and riots and violence and looting and destruction of statues and memorials and monuments, arson, and these things called autonomous zones and uh, police-free zones. Even our church isn't, police, isn't a police-free zone. We have one that comes every week. So uh, anarchy seems to be the order of the day today. Well, I am certainly one who would denounce such riots and violence destruction and anarchy, but I'm also one who would denounce one of the underlying issues. I say one of them because there are so many issues now that, that this one seems to have been lost in the, in the muck and the mire of all the stuff that's going on today, but one of the issues is racism and bigotry and prejudice. In our series, Encounters with Jesus, we are going to see a couple of different times that Jesus breaks those barriers. Yeah, in, today is one of those occasions I believe we'll see Jesus himself also denounces, just by his example, any racism or prejudice in Christians' lives. We're in John chapter 4. We've entitled it, An Encounter at a Well. Jesus, in this chapter, encounters a Samaritan woman and engages in a rather lengthy conversation with her. So today we're going to look first at the setting that, that sets the stage here, the encounter with Jesus. Then we're going to talk, we're just going to walk our way through the interaction between Jesus and the Samaritan woman. And finally, we'll wrap it up with looking at three different responses to Jesus. So first of all, Jesus' encounter with the woman. John chapter 4, I want to just read the first seven verses, and then we'll come back and, and look at it. So the Pharisees heard that Jesus was gaining and baptizing more disciples than John. Although, in fact, it was not Jesus who baptized, but his disciples. When the Lord learned of this, he left Judea and went back once again. To Galilee. Now he had to go through Samaria. So he came to a town of Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about the sixth hour. And when a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, will you give me a drink? I want you to go back up to verse 5. Look at that verse, if you will. Okay, let's skip ahead here to verse 5. There we go. One more. He says, now he had to go through Samaria. Did Jesus really have to go through Samaria? Couldn't he have gone another route? In fact, there are actually three routes between Judea, Jerusalem in the south, and Galilee in the north. There's the coastal route. You could go over to the Mediterranean Sea, up the coastline, and back over to Nazareth and the Sea of Galilee. Or you could go the the um, eastern route. You walk, you walk down from Jerusalem, down the hill toward Jericho, you cross the Jordan River, and you walk east, uh, on the north along the east side of the Jordan River, and then you cross back into Galilee up north after you get past Samaria. But then there's the central route that goes right through Samaria and straight into Galilee. So there were three routes. Why did he have to go through Samaria? Let me ask you, which is the shortest route? The central route, straight up. So maybe he was just tired and wanted to go the short route. Well, the truth is, which route did the Jews travel? The Jews always took the eastern route. Why? Because they hated Samaritans so much that they wouldn't even travel through their country. 
there was this deep-seated prejudice that was sourced in, in, in a feud that had been brewing for over 500 years. Way back in the 700s, they didn't know it was the 700s, but now that we date them, 700 BC, when Assyria conquered Israel, most of the Jews were taken captive and scattered throughout the Assyrian Empire, but some were left behind there in Israel. And those that were left behind eventually intermarried with foreigners who moved into the land from Assyria and Babylon and Persia and perhaps even Egypt. And so the Jews considered these uh, people there in Israel and Samaria half-breeds. They were half-Jewish, half-Gentile. And so they were given the label Samaritans. In Ezra chapter, chapters three through four, the Samaritans became rather jealous as they were, began to rebuild the temple there in Jerusalem. And Ezra denied them the opportunity to participate, to help in the rebuilding process. And so they decided, a few years later, that they would build their own temple. And they built their own temple there on Mount Gerizim, which was not really worship of the true God, but more idolatrous worship uh, because they had married Gentiles. Well, that temple was destroyed in 128 BC, and, and, but the Samaritans continued to worship on the hill where that temple had been built. And so because of this 500 year feud, there was a very deep seated religious and racial hatred between Jews and Samaritans. It actually went both directions. The, and so the Jews did anything and everything they could to avoid Samaritans even to the point of taking a longer route to get to the north, to get to Galilee. They did everything they could to avoid going through Samaria. They just couldn't stand any contact with Samaritans. That's why the parable of the Good Samaritan stands out so much. So then, we would ask the question, why does Jesus have to go through, why did he have to go through Samaria? Was he in a hurry? Was he tired of traveling? No, I don't think so. I think it's because Jesus knew that he had a divine appointment to keep. An appointment there with a Samaritan woman who needed to be redeemed. And he goes to this village called Sychar. Sychar happens to be a parcel of land that's very important in Israel's history. It's a piece of real estate that was purchased by Jacob. You remember Jacob? Jacob was later renamed what? Israel. So he's the father of Israel. And he purchased this land and later gave it to his sons, particularly to, to Joseph. And so it's also the place where the bones of Joseph were laid to rest following uh, the return from, from Egypt, following the Exodus. Verse 6 tells us it's the sixth hour. The sixth hour being about 12 o'clock noon in our time. Jesus and his disciples had been traveling all morning. They were hungry. They were thirsty. And so the disciples went into town to see if they could buy some food. Jesus waited at the well. In verse 7, it tells us there he met a woman. Now I want you to think about this encounter for a moment from the woman's perspective, okay? She's a Samaritan. She knows this thing of racism and prejudice. She's a woman with very little respect in society. And she's been married five times to five different men, slept in five different beds, has, has gone through five different divorces. And she's currently living with a man who is not her husband. Well, on this particular day, she came to the well at noon. Why at noon? Why not early in the morning when all the women normally come to the well? Well, maybe she had come earlier and maybe she just needed an extra draw of water. We don't know. But more than likely, she was simply trying to avoid the other women who looked on her with disdain because of her past. So perhaps a walk, uh, a walk in the hot sun was a small price to pay in order to escape their looks and their sharp tongues as well. You know, here she comes. See, there's that, that woman. Ha, ha, have you heard? She, she's divorced again, and, and now she's, she's shacking up with another guy. You know, those are the, the kinds of things that, that she would probably hear. And so on this day, she comes at noon. 
Her feet stir up the dust on a path, and her eyes, she probably walks with her eyes looking down, not even looking up, just to avoid the stairs. And she expected to be all alone at the well. When she arrives at the well, she looks up. Uh Uh-oh, there's a man there. She looks a little closer. He's Jewish. What is he doing here? And so she just decided to just go about her business. She begins to draw her water, when all of a sudden, he speaks to her and asks, may I have a drink? And thus begins a very interesting, intriguing dialogue between Jesus and this Samaritan woman in verses 7 through 26. I want to just read through the entire dialogue, then we'll come back and look at it in in sections, okay? Beginning in verse 7. Jesus said to her, will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into the town to buy food. Verse 9, the Samaritan woman said to him, you are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who it, who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us the well and drank from it himself? As did also his sons and his flocks and herds? Jesus answered, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water I give him will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give him will become in him a spring of water, willing up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. He told her, Go call your husband and come back. I have no husband, she replied. Jesus said to her, You're right. When you say you have no husband, the fact is you have had five husbands, and the man you now have is not your husband. What you have just said is quite true. Sir, the woman said, I I can see that you're a prophet. Our fathers worshiped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. Jesus declared, believe me, woman, the time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know, we worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit and his worshipers must worship in spirit and in truth. The woman said, I know that Messiah, called Christ, is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus declared, I who speak to you am he. Very intriguing conversation. We're going to walk through it and and just see how Jesus appeals to this woman and and then her defenses and how they come up and all the different tricks she uses to try to change the subject and and avoid the conversation. So first of all, Jesus begins by breaking the tradition of his day by simply speaking to the woman and politely asking for a drink. Jesus would never break a command of God but he often broke meaningless rituals and traditions. And one of those traditions was this prejudice against Samaritans. He had come to redeem this woman, and he knew exactly how to reach her. But she was wearing this emotional armor that had been built up over years, years of abuse. And so while Jesus appealed to her kindness, she responded, very defensively in in verse nine. The Samaritan woman said, you are a Jew and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? And so here she is responding defensively, even though Jesus appealed to her kindness. She was shocked that he would ask for a drink. The tone of her question is in in effect says, what are you doing asking me for a drink? Don't you know the rules around here? I'm beneath you as a non-Jew, as a a woman, and as a Samaritan. And you're asking me for a drink? And so what we see here is that in one fell swoop, Jesus overcame centuries of prejudicial barriers. 
And he shows us by his example very clearly that there is no place for racism or bigotry or chauvinism or prejudices in the hearts of his followers. Now I know that the riots today have moved way beyond this issue of racism. In fact, the issue of racism is almost lost in the rhetoric and the, and the shenanigans that are going on today. But I wanna just emphasize here that there really is no room, no place for racism in the church today, in the hearts of God's children, God's followers. So I pray that the church, the church of Jesus Christ might be the instruments of God who bring peace and unity to our world today. Jesus calls Christians to love other people, to accept people even, even as Jesus loved us and as Jesus accepted us. And so I would just encourage you, take a moment and, and examine your own heart. If there is any racism, chauvinism, prejudices of any kind, can I be honest with you? It's sin. It's sin. And it needs to be confessed to God as such and repented of. Examine your heart. Follow Jesus' example. Break through those racial barriers. Reach out to people who are different and love them and accept them even as Jesus loved and accepted us. That's the first set. Then Jesus goes on. He, he appeals to her curiosity while she in turn responds back to him sarcastically. Verse 10, uh, Jesus says, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that asked you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. And so Jesus, he doesn't respond to her defensiveness. Instead, he says, if you knew who you're talking to, you'd be asking me for a drink. And, and I would give you a drink, not of this kind of water, but of living water. And so he uses a phrase that just piques her interest, raises her curiosity. He's a master communicator. He's just responding very casually here, and then he just drops this intriguing phrase that, that raises her curiosity. What is living water? How is that different than this water? Where can I get some of this living water? But she responds a bit sarcastically. Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with, and this well is very deep. Where are you gonna get living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob? You see the little tone of cynicism or sarcasm there? Essentially, essentially she says, hey, this well is really deep and, and your bucket, which you don't even have, but your bucket doesn't even reach down that far to the water. So where do you plan to get this living water from? And then she responds to Jesus' insinuation that he is someone special by referring to the history of, of this site. Are, are you greater than our father Jacob? <laughs> well, actually he is, but he doesn't say so yet. This is, when I get here, this is a pretty intelligent woman with a sense of humor, but, but I think her rough life has dulled her edge and she has become defensive and, and cynical in the process. At this point, most men would have shrugged her off and left, but Jesus isn't like most other men. He's compassionate. And so he's there to redeem her. Which leads into the third step in this conversation. Jesus appeals to her spiritual need. She then, in return, responds with, with avoidance. Verses 13 through 14. Jesus says, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water that I give him will never thirst. Then he goes on and he says, indeed the water I give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. Again, he, Jesus bypasses her response and, and appeals directly to her spiritual need. She's kind of stuck here on the physical, physical thirst. Jesus is talking about spiritual thirst. She needed new life. Sin had destroyed her old life, and both emotionally and spiritually, and, and she has, she's kind of stopped living and is just existing right now, merely existing. And so she needs this living water. She needs this spring of water that will well up to eternal life. But she responds with some avoidance. Sir, give me this water so that I don't get thirsty and have to keep coming 
here to draw water. She, she's either stuck on the physical or she's deliberately avoiding the real issue. I think she probably understands that Jesus is, is talking here about some deeper things. But she avoids it by staying on the physical level here. Many times people avoid talking about spiritual issues, don't they? Because it's just a lot easier to focus on the physical things in life. In fact, people often look to physical substitutes in life, like addictions and affairs to, to satisfy their spiritual longings. And so they avoid spiritual discussions at all costs because they're just too painful for them. Well, Jesus goes on and he appeals now to her personal life, her personal interest, and she responds in denial. He told her in verse 16, go call your husband and come back. Now, in most conversations, no one's going to be offended by this request. But Jesus knew the dilemma that this posed for her. He knew about her lifestyle. On the surface, it seems kind of innocent, but, but Jesus is really appealing to a deeper personal longing. And I'm sure that when she heard this, her heart probably sank right into her stomach. Here's this Jewish man that didn't care that she's a Samaritan, and, and, and he's the closest thing to, to gentleness and, and caring and compassion that she's ever, ever met. But now, she's asking about about this, about her husband. And so she replies, I have no husband. She may have thought about lying, I don't know. You know, she could have said my husband's out of town or he's busy, but instead she denies having a husband. Well, it's a denial, but it's also a half truth. She had a man, but she wasn't married. So she's kind of telling the truth, but really denying where she's at, denying the truth of what her life is all about. And so we go on, and Jesus appeals to her conscience, while she then responds by deflecting to another completely different issue. Verses 17 through 18, Jesus said to her, you're right when you say you have no husband. The fact is you have five husbands, and the man you now have is not your husband. I think Jesus uses his supernatural knowledge here to take this conversation below the surface, a little deeper. He commends her for the truthful half of her half-truth, but then he kind of sets aside all fun and games and, and appeals directly to her conscience. Notice, though, he didn't condemn her. He didn't shame her. He didn't exploit her sinfulness. He merely stated the truth and let the truth stand on its own. You've had five husbands, but the man you're now living with is not your husband. And so he's appealing here, here to her conscience. He knew that her soul is probably feeling the, the guilt and the shame of her past lifestyle. How does she respond? She deflects to another issue. Ah, oh, I can see that you're a prophet. Our fathers worshiped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. What does that have to do with anything that they've been talking about? Nothing, really. Many times when someone's guilt or shame is revealed, it leaves them feeling e emotionally naked, kind of like Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. And their natural response then is to run for cover. Well, to her credit, she didn't run. Jesus is a master communicator here. He allows her to see his genuine concern and he treats her as a person, not as an object. He speaks to her with respect, with dignity. He speaks compassionately to her spiritual need. But what does she do? She quickly changes the subject, deflects to another issue. Ah, so you've been to seminary, you must be very smart. I've got a question that I've been thinking about for a long, long time. How do you reconcile God's sovereignty with, with man's free will? Well, that's not exactly what she said. That's what we would ask today. But in her culture, in her day, the great debate was where to worship. Do we have to go to Jerusalem and worship at the temple of the Jews, or can we worship here on Mount Gerizim, at the site of Jacob's well? The great issue of the day. Jesus, again, responds. He appeals to her soul this time. And she responds by delaying her decision. 
Look at these verses, verses 21 through 24. Believe me, woman, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation comes from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship in spirit and in truth. I wish I could think as fast on my feet as Jesus does, but I'm not Jesus. But he, he neither indulges her ploy to change the subject, nor does he ignore her question. He actually uses her distraction to, to direct the conversation right back to the real issue, her soul. Your soul, her soul. Did you catch how many times, did you see it up here as we went through the verses? Did you catch how many times Jesus spoke of worship or of worshipers? Eight times. In just four verses, he used the word worship or worshipers. And so what, what I see here is that Jesus is addressing the deepest yearning of a person's soul. The need to worship someone bigger, greater than myself. Pascal put it this way, there is a God-shaped vacuum in the heart of every man which cannot be satisfied by any created thing, but only by God the creator. Now, to be perfectly honest with you, it would take an entire message to unpack the truth in these four verses. There is a lot here, a lot to unpack here. But let me just uh, let's kind of summarize it in three separate points. The first point is this. The earth, what Jesus says is the earthly location of worship is of secondary concern. A temple is given for the benefit of people, not for God. It just helps keep our attention. We tend to wander. Well, the temple helps focus our attention. In fact, the Jews, even though they were exiled years before and the temple lay in ruins, they, many of them still faithfully worshiped their God. So God doesn't care if you worship in Samaria or if you worship in Jerusalem. He doesn't care if you worship in America or Africa or the Antarctica. He doesn't care where you worship. He doesn't care if you worship in a church building or at a park or in a home. The location is not of primary concern. It's of secondary concern. So the second observation I make is that the object of worship is the primary concern. Make no mistake about it, the Samaritan temple was designed and built in direct opposition to the reconstruction of the efforts of Nehemiah and Ezra to rebuild the temple in Jerusalem. And so Jesus here does not in any way shy away from the truth. The Samaritans were idolatrous at best. <laughs> they did not worship the one true God. They worshiped idols brought in by the Gentiles that they intermarried with. And so wherever you worship, it's the object of worship that is most important, that is crucial. We're to worship the one true God, Yahweh, the God of the Bible, and Him only. It brings me to the third point. True worship is both heartfelt and genuine. God does not look at externals. God looks at the heart. Even though the Jews worshiped the true God, their worship of God at this time was often very hypocritical. There were money changers, even as they spoke, um, polluting the temple in Jerusalem. And the Pharisees were all about external show. They were hypocrites. And so Jesus says that God isn't concerned with the outward show or the rituals or the liturgy of worship. God isn't all that concerned with our styles, our methodologies of worship. You know, we like to argue about hymns or contemporary music or pews or chairs or what instruments are we to use. God says, I don't care. It doesn't matter. What matters is your heart. That's what matters. God desires authentic worship that flows from a heart that is devoted and a heart that is genuine and authentic. That's what God desires. In fact, he in the verse and he says, God is seeking worshipers. The only time in scripture where we see that terminology, God is actually seeking something. What is he seeking? Worshipers. God wants to turn rebels into worshipers who will worship him. 
Like I said, we could spend a long time on those verses, but that's all we'll say. Jesus, or the woman then uh, changes the su- uh, doesn't change the subject here. She, she um, just kind of delays her decision, okay? She responds by saying, the wo- I know that Messiah, called Christ, that's basically Greek for Messiah, is coming. I know the Messiah is coming. And when he comes, he will explain everything to us. This is kind of her last line of defense here. Delay, maybe later. You know, this is a common tactic that is used today as well. Not right now. I'll think about it. Maybe later I'll commit to Christ. And so she tries to put an end to the conversation, claiming that all matters of theology will one day be resolved when Messiah comes. In other words, no one really knows the truth until the Messiah himself comes to reveal the truth. Little did she know that she's playing right into Jesus' hands. (laughs) And so we conclude the conversation. Jesus challenges her to a commitment. Verse 26, he simply says, I who speak to you am he. This must have just blown her away. Jesus cuts through all of her defenses and lays before her the ultimate truth. In effect, Jesus says, great. You don't have to wait any longer. Your wait is over. You don't have to wait any longer. The Messiah is here. I am the Messiah. I am the promised one standing right here in front of you. That's the ultimate challenge. What will she now do with this truth? Will she reject it and laugh at Jesus or will she accept Jesus as Messiah and Savior? So that leads us to the conclusion of this story in verses 27 through 42. We actually see three different responses to Jesus. Let's let's read the whole section there, verses 27 through 40, and then we'll come back. Just then the disciples returned. They have perfect timing, don't they? Not so much. But just then the disciples returned and, and were surprised to find him talking with the woman. But no one asked, what do you want? Or why are you talking with her? When leaving her water jar, uh, then leaving her water jar, the woman went back to the town and said to the people, come, see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Christ? Could this be Messiah? They came out of the town and made their way toward him. Meanwhile, his disciples urged him, Rabbi, eat something. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you know nothing about. Then his disciples said to each other, could someone have brought him food? My food, said Jesus, is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Do you not say four months more and then the harvest? I tell you, open, a, open your eyes and look at the fields. They are ripe for harvest. Even now the reaper draws his wages. Even now he harvests the crop for eternal life so that the sower and the reaper may be glad together. Thus the saying, one sows and another reaps is true. I sent you to reap what you have not worked for. Others have done the hard work and you have reaped the benefits of their labor. Many of the Samaritans from the town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I ever did. And so when the Samaritans came to him, they urged him to stay with them, and he stayed two days. And because of his words, many more became believers. They said to the woman, we no longer believe just because of what you said. Now we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this man really is the savior of the world. You see the three responses there? First, how do the disciples respond? They respond by questioning Jesus. Oh, they didn't say it out loud, but you know they're thinking it. What are you doing here, Jesus? Why in the world are you talking to this Samaritan woman? Don't you know that we have nothing to do with Samaritans? Come on, Jesus, what are you thinking? They didn't say it, but they're sure thinking it. Well, Jesus told them to open their eyes and look at the harvest. The harvest is ready to reap, he said. There are souls to be won, souls to be redeemed. It doesn't matter if they are Jews or Samaritans or Romans or Greeks, it doesn't matter. They need salvation. Jesus came to redeem all. Second response is the woman invited others to come and meet Jesus. 
verses 28 through 30. She was so excited, she just, uh, about the discussion, she just left her water jar there, and water jar there at the well, and, and ran as fast as she could right back into town, and, and told everybody, hey, you guys gotta come see this guy. He's amazing, he, 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 he told me all about myself, my own life. Could this really be the Messiah? Well, isn't that what all of us are supposed to do when we meet Jesus? Run back to our oikos? Our family, our neighbors, our friends, and invite them to come meet Jesus too? Isn't that what we're all supposed to do? Have you invited someone to meet Jesus recently? You know, with all the fear in society today over coronavirus and uh, these riots that are taking place, this is actually a great time to talk to people about Jesus because Jesus is the answer to all of their fears and all of their needs. Have you invited someone to meet Jesus? Well, that leads to the third response. The Samaritans believed, verses 39 through 42. They came out to meet Jesus. And not only did they come and meet him and hear him talk there, they invited Jesus and his disciples to stay in town for a while. And they did, for two days. I can imagine the disciples kind of looking around, what what are we doing here? We're we're staying in a Samaritan village? I don't know about this, but they do. And they are able to talk and interact with the Samaritan people. And many believed in Jesus. Skip ahead a few years. Acts chapter eight. Philip went to Samaria and preached the gospel. And many responded to the gospel that Philip preached and trusted Christ. Could it be in part due to the witness of this uh, this Samaritan woman and the others in Sychar? Very possibly. This was the first convert in Samaria. What an encounter. Quite an encounter between Jesus and a Samaritan woman. Lots of lessons that we can learn. We could have camped on any section of this for a while. What I want you to see here is that Jesus plowed through all of her defenses and brought her to a point of commitment. And when this woman met to Jesus, her life was changed. And she in turn invited her oikos to meet Jesus as well. So it leaves us with two questions today. First of all, have you had a life-changing encounter with Jesus yourself? Have you had that encounter with Christ that has literally changed your life? If not, there's no better time than right now. Jesus wants to change your life radically. I trust that you've had that encounter. The second question then is, are you inviting your oikos to come and meet Jesus as well? Just like this woman did. Are you inviting your oikos? You see, when Jesus changes our lives, how can we keep that quiet? We gotta invite someone, don't we? Let's pray. Thanks, Lord, for this day. Thanks for the challenge from your word. Just pray that we too might uh, encounter Jesus the way this woman did and just that Jesus would in fact change our lives and then Lord, as, as he does, that we would just share that with other people as well. Father, we thank you for your word. Just thank you for the challenge today. And Lord, I just pray that you will just continue to minister to each of us and may we just be reminded of these truths throughout the week. And may we just open our eyes to see the harvest that is before us and and invite our oikos, our friends, our neighbors to meet Jesus as well. We pray these things in his name. Amen.